Hello and welcome to this lecture on life history as part of basic course in ornithology. Before we begin this lecture, I'll take you through some key definitions that will make it easier to understand the content of the lecture. I'll begin with reproductive success, which refers to an individual's production of offspring over a lifetime. Uh, fitness, which refers to the number of offspring that go on to survive and reproduce themselves. Parity uh, defines the number of episodes of reproduction that an individual, uh, adult individual goes through. Clutch size refers to the number of eggs laid per reproductive episode in case of birds. Fecundity also uh, refers to the number of eggs laid over a specific time interval. So if this specific time interval uh, coincides with one reproductive episode, then it is the same as clutch size. But you can also talk about fecundity over a breeding season or over multiple years. Uh, fertility refers to the number of eggs that are hatched, uh, that is fertilized or viable eggs. Uh, and finally, survival refers to the proportion of individuals that survive between uh, two points in time. Uh, survival, uh, when we talk about survival in this particular case, we'll be talking about the survival of adults. So it will refer to the proportion of adult individuals within a population that survive between two time points. Uh, and this is usually uh, uh, taken uh, at an annual rate. So usually we are talking about annual survival of adults. Uh, moving on, uh, let's first uh, define life history. So life history in its simplest terms refers to the lifetime pattern of survival, growth and reproduction that we see in any species. And in nature, when we look around us, we see a wide variety of life histories, even among seemingly very similar looking species. Uh, take this thrush for example. Uh, among these thrushes, typically they start uh, reproducing at the age of one and produce several broods of three to four chicks every year. And these species rarely live beyond three or four years uh, in all. Uh, in contrast, uh, when we look at petrels, which are very similar in size to these thrushes, they uh, start reproducing reprodu much later at uh, four to five years of age. Uh, they produce a single chick every year, but uh, in contrast to thrushes which live for just four, three or four years, uh, these petrels live 10 times as much. So they live for between 30 to 40 years. Uh, so what causes these difference in uh, life histories or uh, more specifically we can ask what determines the age at which a bird starts reproducing, how many eggs it produces during each reproductive episode and finally how long do they live. And uh, life history theory is basically the analytical framework that we use to explain these kind of inter and intraspecific variations that we see around us in terms of traits such as survival of adults, they, the growth rate that they, uh, you know, see uh, within them and the reproductive traits as well. And since these traits affect an individual's fitness as well as the dynamics of the entire population, uh, life history theory uh, lies at the intersection of ecology and evolution. Uh, what we, uh, what life history theory assumes is that organisms face a number of trade-offs due to constraints imposed by the amount of resources or energy that is at their disposal, the physiology that they have which will dis then go on to dis decide the kind of eggs or the number of eggs that they can produce, the rate at which eggs and chicks then go on to develop and finally uh, constraints uh, at the genetic stage which also determine a lot of the life history uh, that organisms show, go on to show. Uh, so, based on these trade-offs and interaction between these traits of survival, growth and reproductive uh, traits, uh, these all go on to decide the individual's fitness uh, in its lifetime. And what we see is that over generations, uh, natural selection then goes on to optimize these trade-offs to come up with a set of traits and trade-off between traits 
which give the best outcome in uh, terms of that in of individuals fitness within that population in a set of uh, environmental conditions overall the end goal is to increase an individuals uh, lifetime reproductive success and fitness which definitely goes beyond uh, you know producing a certain number of uh, or maximum number of offspring uh, and therefore life uh, stages of life history span multiple generations and at every stage of life history an individual is making some decisions to make the best allocation of the finite amount of resources energy and nutrients that are at its disposal at the stage of adults an adult or parent has to make decisions uh, regarding whether it wants to invest energy in reproduction or on its own self maintenance to prolong its life even when it comes to reproduction it has to take multiple decisions for instance uh, how many offsprings should it produce which refers to the fecundity how many times should it reproduce in its lifetime which refers to the parity uh, even when uh, producing a certain number of offspring the adult has to decide whether it should produce few big ones or many small ones of course that is mostly genetically constrained uh, when it comes to uh, then again once the chicks are hatched it has to decide on the amount of energy it needs to invest in parental care which will then go on to de- decide how fast the chicks uh, you know reach maturity uh for the chicks once it reaches maturity it has to decide the age at which it starts reproducing uh which will influence the amount of energy that it spends on it its own survival and persistence and also uh you know age of reproduction is related to how many offspring it goes on to produce over its lifetime that is the reproductive success so there are consequences there as well and this kind of decision making actually goes on at every generation uh please remember here that it's not every individual which is consciously you know weighing and making these calculations and uh, making decisions but rather a strategy an optimal strategy that comes into being through evolution over multiple generations and this is decided by natural selection to optimize or determine what is the best strategy or trade off between these traits that an individual residing in a population can adopt to maximize its individual fitness in a certain set of conditions a uh, certain set of environmental conditions as a result of it as environmental conditions change we also say see a change in or variation in these kind of strat- life history strategies one of the most well known examples is the variation in latitude of clutch sizes in songbirds so we see that songbirds belonging to the same species so individuals belonging to the same species actually lay fewer eggs at the tropics uh, than those individuals which are found to breed at higher latitudes closer to the temperate regions so why does this happen and one of the most commonly uh, used explanations is that uh, there is a lot of lot more seasonality that we see in environmental conditions in the temperate regions uh, with winters being particularly harsh this means that the resources are really low much lower in winter than what you see in the warmer conditions in summer and spring and this very this lowest point in the resource availability is what determines the number of adults that that particular habitat can maintain through the year and as and we also see a large number of adults dying when the winter becomes particularly harsh as a result of it what happens is as we move towards spring and summer resources tend to accumulate because there is a huge increase in the number of resources and because of mortality of adults in the winter there a lot of it remains unused and it is this difference in resource availability between the minimum point in winter and maximum point in summer which allows uh, you know uh, a lot of resources being available to raise larger clutch sizes or larger number of eggs uh, it's also hypothesized that longer days uh, in the temperate region in summer allows more 
uh, time for parents to forage and feed their young to feed these larger clutches. So this difference in carrying capacity between the lowest point in winter and uh, highest point in summer is uh, given as the primary explanation behind larger clutch sizes in temperate regions and this hypothesis is known as Ashmole's hypothesis. In contrast, when we look at tro tropical habitats, we find that there, firstly there is not much seasonality in resource availability. The difference between summer and winter resource availability is not as much as we what we see in the temperate regions and as a result of it, uh, this difference itself between the lowest and highest points uh, in carrying capacities is not much and therefore the clutch sizes we see in tropics in contrast are much smaller. This has been seen across multiple groups of species including Emberiza buntings and Oxyura ducks uh, which have been studied and shown to show this pattern across latitudinal gradients. Uh, but now the next question to ask is Okay, we know that clutch size varies as environmental conditions vary across latitudinal gradient, but what determines the optimal clutch size within a particular site uh, with a certain environmental condition? And this brings us to Lack's optimal clutch hypothesis. What this hypothesis essentially says is that birds could go on increasing their fitness by increasing their clutch size indefinitely unless reduced survival of offspring in large broods somehow offsets this advantage. So basically this hypothesis assumes that as you increase the clutch size, the survival probability of individual offsprings keeps going down and as a result of it, uh, one way or another way of looking at it is that if we just multiply the number of surviving offspring with the probability of survival of individual offsprings and if we plot it against the clutch size, we can find the value which is the highest and this value becomes the optimal clutch size for this particular set of species or species under consideration. Uh, this is not just theoretical, people have found experimental evidence to prove the same. Uh, uh, for instance, in this example with European magpies, they have found that this particular value of optimal clutch size is 7 for this particular for magpies since uh, each time they either added uh, eggs to the nest, uh, for instance if they added an additional one or two eggs to make it 8 or 9 or removed eggs artificially from the nest, the number of chicks that fledged after that reduced. So using this experiment, they, they could show that 7 is the optimal clutch size for magpies. Uh, but please remember that uh, the final goal is not to uh, just produce the number of, highest number of offspring possible at each reproductive episode, but the final goal is instead to increase or maximize total lifetime reproductive success for an individual. And uh, this particular fact is best illustrated uh, using data from this long term study from Witham Woods in Oxford. Uh, this is a very fascinating study and perhaps the longest running ecological monitoring study we, we have anywhere on in the world. Uh, I would urge you all to look up this website to learn more about it because much of what we understand about life history and biological traits, reproductive traits and how they influence life history of species comes from data of, from this project. Uh, the results that I am referring to here uh, come from this uh, monitoring of great tits and blue tits of during a 20 year duration between 1962 and 1982 and during this time 4489 clutches were monitored and uh, this is what the data says. So when they looked at the clutch sizes, distribution of clutch sizes and looked at uh, you know the optimal clutch size they found that 12 was the optimal clutch size which meant that uh, 12 was the maximum no number of eggs for which uh, the maximum number of offsprings were fledged and went on to survive. So uh, this was the optimal clutch size for these species during this period but uh, when they looked at the average number of 
uh, clutch sizes for this population during this period it was not 12 but 8.53 so what it means is that the most commonly seen clutch sizes for this population was not 12 but instead lay between uh, it was either 8 or 9 and uh, the reason behind this uh, is that they found that individuals which were laying 12 eggs or mating pairs that were laying 12 eggs invested so much energy taking care of this large clutch size or large number of chicks that were produced that they often did not have enough energy to reproduce in the next breeding season. As a result of this, overall during their lifetime they ended up producing fewer chicks than the ones which produced just eight or nine chicks at a time because they uh, you know saved some energy which allowed them to continuously breed every breeding season so this goes on to show how finally what is being focused on or maximized uh, you know in, by natural selection is one's lifetime reproductive success and not uh, so that's why optimal uh, clutch size is often not the mean clutch size that we see in wild populations again life history is an outcome of evolution which occurs over many many generations and likely reflect adaptations to environmental conditions in which natural selection occurred but does that mean that species that occupy similar environments will show similar life histories to answer this question we can begin with two broad types of environments variable in time and short-lived and the second one could be little more stable or relatively more stable over time uh, based on these two broad types of environments, uh, Robert MacArthur and E.O. Wilson identified two different uh, life history strategies which are uh, adopted by species to occur in these two contrasting types of environments. The R-selected species have traits that work towards increasing their reproductive output or population growth. K-selected species are the ones that have traits that increase competitive ability of individuals or survival of adults. Most species lie along a continuum uh, moving from R selected to K selected depend depending on their relative investment in reproduction versus uh, maintenance of adults. For instance, uh, short-lived small-bodied oysters produce up to 500 million eggs a year. In contrast, a Puma produces just a single uh, two eggs per year and chimpanzees produce just one egg every five years but these large bodied mammals usually invest a lot more uh, energy in parental care as well as maintenance of adults. R selected and K selected uh, species differ from each other in some fundamental characteristics and these are tabulated here for instance our selected species are adapted to live in unstable ephemeral environments, have smaller body sizes, produce many offspring, reach uh, the age of maturity earlier, have shorter life expectancy, show rapid population growth, uh, show almost no or minimal parental care. Uh, they have very weak competitive ability and show density independent growth. Uh, the population size might be very variable from time to time, time and uh, it is often uh, maintained well below the carrying capacity of the environment. Uh, similarly, mortality is also very variable and unpre unpredictable among these species and they typically follow type 3 survivorship curve. In contrast, K-selected species are adapted uh, to live in stable environments, they have larger body sizes, they produce fewer offsprings at each time and reach age of maturity much later in life. They typically live for many years, uh, show slow population growth rate, a lot of parental care, uh, strong competitive ability and density dependent regulation of population. They typically maintain some, uh, stable population sizes which is maintained pretty close to the environmental carrying capacity and mortality in these species is relatively constant and more predictable and these species typically follow type 1 or 2 type of 
survivorship curve. Now let's just see what these survivorship curves look like. Survivorship curves are graphical representation of the percentage of organisms that survive at different ages. Uh, and if you look at our selected species, they show the type 3 type of survivorship curve. Here, uh, this is characterized by a lot of mortality in the early ages and then it kind of becomes stable as it reaches the life's end. Uh, a species showing type 2 type of survivorship curve have constant rate of mortality throughout their lifetime and birds belong, belong to this category. Uh, larger bodied animals, uh, typically mammals like humans, elephants show the type 1 type of uh, survivorship curve and uh, they uh, are characterized by very low mortality early on and it kind of stays stable for a long time uh, and after a certain age, mortality increases drastically. Both type 1 and type 2 uh, types of uh, curve survivorship curves can be shown by case selected species. So typically optimal life history strategy uh, tries to strike the best balance between the contrasting demands of adult survival and reproduction uh, to maximize, maximize the lifetime reproductive success of an individual. Uh, for, uh, this is quite difficult to achieve and for instance a bird might invest a lot of energy in keeping a watch out for predators. This might in turn increase that particular adult's survival but because of all this time spent in being watchful, it might not be able to invest as, as much time in mating and therefore might result having very few offspring. On the other hand, uh, when individuals spend a lot of time in reproduction, they are not able to spend as much time in self-maintenance and therefore might not live very long. So, individuals or organisms are constantly trying to strike the best balance between these two contrasting demands to get or optimize or maximize their lifetime reproductive success. Among birds, uh, there are many trade-offs which are commonly seen and we'll be looking at examples of some of these uh, such as a, a trade-off between age at first reproduction and reproductive success, fecundity and survival, growth and fecundity in the subsequent slides. Uh, to understand the trade-off between age of first reproduction and reproductive success, let's look at uh, this hypothetical example. Here is a long-lived species. Uh, which uh, basically lives for eight years uh, in all and uh, here we can see in this table that individuals that reprodu start reproducing uh, at an early age or at the age of one typically produce just one offspring every year subsequently. Similarly, individuals that uh, start reproducing at the age of two uh, go on to reproduce and have two offsprings each year and uh, three, the ones who start reproducing at three go on to have three offsprings each year and so on. Uh, in this table, we can see the cumulative number of offspring that uh, are produced uh, by any individual depending on the age at which it started reproducing. And here we can see that depending on how long an individual lives or depending on the lifespan, the age at which it should start reproducing to get the maximum reproductive success is different. For instance, an individual which lives for eight years can achieve the maximum reproductive success uh, of 20 offspring if it starts reproducing at four or five years of age. In contrast, an individual which lives for a shorter period of time, say five years, should ideally start reproducing at the age of three so that it can achieve the maximum reproductive output of nine that is possible for this lifespan. In general, we find that long-lived organisms typically begin to reproduce at a later or older age than short-lived ones as is also evidenced through this hypothetical example. And uh, as we can see that natural selection favors the age of maturity uh, which results in the greatest number of offspring 
over the lifetime of the individual. So it depends on how long a species lives. Uh, this is not just hypothetical. People have found uh, examples of uh, this trade-off in the wild as well. For instance, for collared flycatchers, uh, people have documented that females which produce or start reproducing at the age of one typically have lower reproductive success than those that start reproducing at the age of two. Uh, we also see a trade-off between parental ex experience and the number of uh, and their fitness. For instance, here in this case of uh, shear waters, people have found that uh, more in uh, early on or parents with very little experience tend to produce young ones of which very few go on to produce reproduce further whereas more experienced uh, parents produce a greater proportion of young ones who go on to reproduce themselves. Uh, in terms of fecundity which is the number of uh, eggs or chicks uh, eggs produced uh, per reproductive episode uh, it has a clear you know, increasing, uh, it shows an increasing trend uh, as the reproductive investment increases. So, the more an individual invests in reproduction, it can produce higher number of eggs per reproductive episode. But it, this relationship or this curve tapers off as the reproductive investment increases and this happens due to diminishing returns on the environment, on the investment. Let's see what it means. So, for instance, for an individual or mating pair having just one offspring, adding a second offspring leads to a 100% increase in reproductive success uh, given by this equation here. But for a mating pair having four uh, offspring, adding a fifth offspring leads to just a 25% increase in reproductive success as is given by this equation. But we must remember that producing each offspring, each additional offspring requires the same amount of investment. So as we can see, as the number of uh, offspring increases for the same amount of investment in reproduction, you get lesser return in terms of the reproductive success and that's why this curve tapers off. Uh, adult survival decreases steadily as energy is diverted to reproduction and based on these two, we see that adult survival decreases steadily as fecundity or the number of eggs produced increases. This has also been confirmed using experimental studies. Uh, here uh, for kestrels, uh, what they did was uh, for both males and females, they found this to be true. When they added two additional chicks, they, show, they, they found the ad annual adult survival decline. Whereas when they removed two chicks from the nest, uh, this meant that the adults had to invest less in parental care and this increased the annual adult survival for both male and female parents. Uh, the relationship between adult fitness and fecundity can be expressed in terms of a mathematical expression. Uh, so F denotes the adult fitness and uh, there are two components to it. One is, as we as we know, fitness involves you know reproduction as well as the ability of the offspring to go on to reproduce themselves. So basically, the offspring has to survive. So uh, when we look at the components in this expression, uh, there are two components related to adult survival probability. Uh, first is SR, which is the adult survival uh, probability related to reproduction. Then there is SN which is the adult survival probability not related to reproduction. Similarly, there are two terms uh, which are uh, involved uh, when it comes to reproduction part of the expression. So, the number of offspring produced or fecundity is denoted by B and probability of that offspring surviving to one year of age is denoted by S0. Uh, putting all this together, F is given by a product of the adult survival related to reproduction and adult survival unrelated to reproduction and uh, added and we to this we add the survival uh, probability of the offspring to one year of age uh, and a product of it with the number of offspring produced. So this becomes S plus S0 and into B.
based on this equation uh, if uh, an individual or an adult has a long lifespan but produces few offspring this typically leads to a lower s0 by sn uh, ratio and in this case the best uh, strategy would be to maximize adult survival and have fewer young ones uh, on the other hand if the adult has a typically shorter lifespan but many of the offspring survive then this ratio becomes high and in this case uh, it is best to adopt a strategy which maximizes reproduction over adult survival. We also find that there is a trade-off between growth or production of body mass in the adults and their fecundity. Uh, overall, usually we see that the larger the birds are, the more uh, egg biomass that they can produce. So, larger birds typically produce larger eggs or more number of eggs overall. Uh, but when you look at the uh, relationship between the body mass of adults and the percentage of egg biomass to body mass, that is of, uh, you know, how much uh, investment do they put in with respect to their own uh, body size, we find that larger birds typically put lesser amount of investment uh, in reproduction or production of eggs when compared to smaller birds. So, smaller birds produce uh, or invest a greater proportion into reproduction than larger birds. Another decision that individuals have to make with respect to reproduction is how often should they breed during their lifetime or their parity uh, and based on that uh, there are two broad categories of organisms that we can identify. The first category uh, are the semilparous organisms. Uh, they usually have a single highly fecund bout of reproduction. What this means is they reproduce just once and produce copious or numerous uh, you know offspring in that one bout. The uh, investment in the, their investment in reproduction is so high that there is nothing left for the adult to survive anymore. So they often die after the very first bout of reproduction, produce a many, many, uh, but very tiny offspring. And these organisms are usually short-lived. Uh, so examples include annual plants like grasses, which produce copious amounts of seeds, invertebrates, uh, spider, and of course, the most famous examples, uh, which you all must have seen on TV, the salmons. Uh, the second category are the Iteroparous uh, species. And most mammals, reptiles, and birds belong to this category. They are characterized by repeated bouts of reproduction throughout their uh, lifetime. Uh, they rep as it is, um, basically what it means is they reproduce several times during their lifetime. A uh, few large offspring are produced and usually these species are very long lived. Uh, uh, again, an adult also has to decide on the amount of energy it wants to invest in caring for the young or uh, this is known as parental invest, uh, investment. And based on parental investment, we again have two categories of birds. The first are the atracial birds. They produce helpless naked offspring. Uh, so, typically it involves a shorter gestation period, very low investment in incubation of eggs and uh, more uh, parental care is required when the chicks hatch. So, because they are born so helpless, they are fed by the birds for a long period till they can fledge. Um, so, that's the stage where the parent invests a lot of energy and examples of this include uh, most songbirds or passerines woodpeckers, swallows. Uh, on the other hand, other precocial birds, they produce uh, more mature offspring. They are quite much bigger and not so helpless. Uh, but this requires longer gestation period. Uh, they spend much more uh, in incubating their eggs. But once the chicks are out or hatch, they are able to feed themselves almost immediately. And examples of precocial birds include ducks, shorebirds and pheasants. So these are the two categories, atricial birds and precocial birds based on the amount of parental investment. Um, here is a representation of different large 
groups of birds based on where they sit on this continuum from atlesial to precocial. Uh, so uh, you can see there are parrots at the very end. Uh, they are they produce atricial youngs. Uh, songbirds uh, have also have atricial young. Gull lies somewhere in between. Ducks and pheasants have precocial young. Uh, so this brings us to the end of the lecture on life history. Thank you. Thank you.